I'm Sylvan Kaufman, and I'm here at Atkins Arboretum today to tell you about the Jack in the Pulpit, Erisema triphyllum. Jack in the Pulpits are in the Arum Araceae family, like their cousin, the skunk cabbage. They often grow close together in damp, shady places, although you can find Jack in the Pulpits on slightly drier ground. As a member of the Arum family, they're known for their flowers made up of a spathe and spadix. Someone with a good imagination decided that the spathe resembled a pulpit, and the spadix was Jack the Preacher, although Jack was also a colloquial name for the devil. I suppose they were thinking of the pulpits like these with the baffle that helped amplify the preacher's voice. The spathe of the plant is considerably less ornate, but it does sometimes feature jaunty green, white, and purple stripes. Turns out that often Jill sits in the pulpit of this sex-changing plant. The pollen and ovaries are located near the base of the otherwise smooth spadix. Male flowers have four stamens like these, and female flowers have a fuzzy stigma. Plants tend to start out life as male. They switch to being female as they grow and have access to more resources, or they've stored more resources in their starchy roots, and then they might revert to being male again. It takes less energy to produce pollen than it does to make seeds, so when plants have plenty of resources, they'll be female. This strategy is called size-dependent sequential hermaphroditism. The spathe shelters flowers hidden at the base of the spadix, helping to prevent rainwater from building up around the flowers and washing away pollen. Insects like fungus gnats are drawn to the flowers by the smell and by the color of the pollen. Often larger insects become trapped at the base, unable to climb up the smooth spathe. In this diagram, you can see that the male flower has a small flap at the base, so a fungus gnat can fly in, fly down and collect pollen, escape through the little gap, and fly over to a female flower to pollinate it. However, once it gets to the female flower, there is no escape hatch, and the insects often die at the base. Although there is no sign that Jack and the Pulpits are carnivorous, those insects that collect and die would eventually provide nutrients as the flower fades and the spathe falls to the ground. And some botanists speculate that Jack in the Pulpit could be evolving to become a carnivorous plant like the pitcher plants. Some flowers have green spathes, and there's speculation that these may be sterile flowers. The purple stripes help guide pollinators, but plants vary considerably in how much purple they have on the spathes. Other names for Jack in the Pulpit make reference to its starchy root, calling it Indian turnip, marsh turnip, pepper turnip, bog onion, and starch wart. The roots are shaped something like a turnip and are called corms. The plant can reproduce asexually by producing cormlets that eventually become separate plants. The production of cormlets seems to be fairly constant, not as dependent on resources as sexual reproduction. Jack Sanders in The Secrets of Wildflowers has a fascinating description of ways the roots have been used. He says, the root contains crystalline calcium oxalate, a powerfully bitter substance that burns so badly it can cause blisters. Schoolboys used to dare their comrades to take a bite of the root, with results the taster would long remember. What was a joke among pupils was serious business for young men of certain American Indian tribes, however. Without complaint or hesitation, they had to eat one of the fiery roots before they could officially enter manhood. Both trick and ritual were dangerous. A calcium oxalate crystal bears many microscopically small but sharp needles that cut and poison the flesh. If the root gets back to the back of the mouth, it can cause enough swelling in the throat to suffocate the victim. People have of course figured out how to make the roots edible through drying or roasting them, and apparently they taste slightly of cocoa powder. Jack in the Pulpit's leaves are three-lobed, or in older leaves they may look like three separate leaflets. Generally, male plants bear one leaf, with a petiole of about to, uh, up to about 14 inches long, and female plants grow taller up to 24 inches and have two leaves. The male plants go dormant first while the female plants are maturing their fruits. Be sure not to confuse them with the more pointy edges of poison ivy. The fruits ripen to a bright red color, attracting birds, including wood thrush and turkeys, as well as rodents and box turtles to eat them and disperse the seeds. It takes about four years from seed germination for a plant to become reproductive. 
The photos of the fruit and box turtle are by Ann Rolfing, a professional photographer and friend who's taken many photos at Adkins Arboretum. Jack in the pulpits are widespread from Florida into Canada and through the Midwest. Their closest North American relative is the green dragon, Aracema draconite dracontium, which has a very long tapered spathe and leaves with 5 to 15 leaflets. Many writers speak of how seeing the jack in the pulpit brings a smile to their face. I'll end with the first part of a poem originally written in 1856 by Caroline Smith of Medford, Massachusetts, and later modified and republished by John Greenleaf Whittier, a Massachusetts Quaker abolitionist. Jack in the pulpit preaches today under the green trees just over the way. Squirrel and song sparrow high on their perch Hear the sweet lily bells ringing to church. Come hear what his reverence rises to say in his painted pulpit this calm Sabbath day. Fair is the canopy over him seen, penciled by nature's hand, black, brown, and green. Green, in his, green is his surplus, green are his bands. In his queer little pulpit, the little priest stands. Mm -hmm.